My name is Robert Ramey. Uh, thank you to, for coming to my presentation. Uh, I see I have an extremely exclusive group today, uh, but that is not important to me at all. You're going to get 100%, as you should. Uh, I'm the, I've been associated with Boost for many years. I'm the uh, author of the Boost Serialization Library. I'm also the uh, maintainer of the Boost Library Incubator, and now I am the author of the uh, Boost Safe Numerics Library, which is the subject of our talk today. Um, <coughs> there's in every conference there's at least one session and usually more where they talk about the problems with integer arithmetic, and uh, that you can this can happen, that can happen, yada yada yada, and it's kind of interesting and it has repercussions and et cetera et cetera. Unfortunately, the, 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 those sessions actually stop before they give you any idea what you can do to actually fix the problem. Uh, they talk about practices you can do to avoid the problem, but they're very ad hoc. Uh, what we're doing today is different. We're going to use the power of C++ to overload all the integer operations to make our own drop-in replacement for integers. And if you use these substitute integers for your regular integers, you will be absolutely certain that your, the expressions in your program that include integers will never fail. They will never deliver a false, resort, uh, false uh, response and continue on. The program might crash at that point, it might fail to compile, but it won't do what it traditionally does, which is return an arithmetically erroneous result and continue to execute. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the, uh, the gist of it. I'm going to talk, uh, sh show a couple cases, and I'm not going to re-, re uh, uh, retread the past, and uh, John uh, Reger made uh, two presentations back to back uh, last year on this subject. Uh, I made a small one two years ago, and uh, there's also some interesting things that due to problems such as this, uh, we have some multi million dollar major fiascos. Uh, nobody's taking credit for them personally. But the fact is that those are the ones we know about. Uh, here's a, a typical case, integer overflow. We have a couple 8-bit integers. We add them together. The C++ compiler promotes them to integers, adds them together, and tries to stuff it and stuffs it back into another 8-bit integer. Um, some C compilers may give you a compile time warning. Uh, but if they, if they don't, or whether they do or not, when they execute this, you will end up with a result in your code which is wrong. And you will continue to use it, and, it'll, and it will be silent. You won't know about it. And uh, here's another common one. Uh, these are conversions that happen, the C compiler does to you, or for you, depending on your perspective, uh, where it, uh, the, depending on the combination of uh, operands, and here we have an unsigned and signed type, uh, depending on the rules of C++, which are a little bit obscure, uh, you'll get a, a result which will not be the result that you expect to see. And, as before, uh, you'll get a compile, you might get a compile time warning, and, uh, but when it comes to execution time, the code will execute, soldier on, and you will have, if your code is important, it will, you will suffer. Uh, Here's another one that happens all the time. We anticipate a certain range of variables, and uh, people uh, type in <laughs> different numbers than we anticipate. We don't check them. We know we're supposed to check them, but a lot of times uh, we forget to do it or uh, for whatever reason, and the uh, x won't contain the uh, variable we expect it to contain. And again, uh, it's unclear whether you'll get some sort of advice that, that that problem has occurred. So there's no way to guarantee under the current regimen that uh, 
that arithmetic errors will not occur. Almost all languages, not just C and C++, almost all languages have a similar problem. There's a couple languages that have a few help. Ada has uh, some integer arithmetic help. Um, C Sharp, I believe, has some functions which, uh, which are helpful there. And, but it's, they're just ad hoc uh, solutions. Uh, this problem has been around for 40 years, since the beginning of C. Uh, we have every year a conference, every year it gets remarked upon, and every year nothing happens until now. Today, September 26, you people are present in the creation. It's a new day. From now on, these problems will not occur. It's the end of error. This enthusiasm is palpable here. <laughs> uh, so here's the, the real solution is uh, we include a part of the safe numeric library and we replace our types int, long, whatever with these types uh, safe int, safe long, etc. Uh, we can do that as soon as we incorporate the uh, safe integer library and uh, make sure we are uh, the boost namespace is available to, the, to us. And this previous example, which we illustrated before, will throw an error at uh, runtime in this case. Because since the uh, addition operation is overloaded and then it will... Uh, detect that the result uh, will not fit into the, the, the variables which C++ has converted these two for its operations. So at that point, uh, if this particular code, something was depending on this being correct, we're saved from a, a, a erroneous result. Now, whenever I expound upon this idea, <laughs> the immediate uh, response is, well, you know, I don't really want to include um, extra runtime checking in every arithmetic operation I do. It's going to slow my program down, which it might uh, or might not. Um, but it's, I will say it doesn't happen nearly as much as one thinks it, would, it will. And that's because of the following. We don't overload every operation and then insert the checking. We analyze the code at runtime, or when the templates are instantiated, and we can compare the types, and we can exclude those cases where an error will never occur anyway and no checking is required. Uh, and, and here's, here's a, the, the, uh, an example similar to the one we had before. X and Y are 16-bit integers. If we're going to store the result in a 32-bit integer, when we do this, this addition, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a number, a result, which is less than 17 bits long. So, and then when you sign it to Z, we, we reserve 32 bits there. We know for an absolute fact that that addition will never fail. So there's no point in checking it, so there's no code emitted in this case. Now that's a key thing, because what it means is uh, it turns out that, and we'll see in a little while, that you can eliminate almost all the runtime checking if you know where to do it. And we have uh, uh, help for determining that. So, um, <coughs> I'm going to use this as an example. Now the next, uh, ob let's call it objection is, well, you know, you're, you guys, and especially in Boost, you know, you're always making this really fancy stuff, and you know, it's too complicated. And by the way, it's not really necessary, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna, I picked out an example here, which is a hard example. Uh, it's a small program written in C, and it operate, it runs the stepper motor of a surgical knife. So next time you guys go in and get a vasectomy, you'll know where it's coming from. So any case, but this got to be right, right? We can't just say, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, you know, there was an overflow. Uh, um, so, the, uh, so we're going to make a program that we have confidence 
Yes, Supreme Confidence is correct. And uh, it drives a stepper motor. Uh, it uses a, a PIC micro microcontroller. This is a very commonly used uh, small one-chip computer. It's a 16-bit processor. It's got 32K uh, memory. Now, we can see that we're already kind of we've got a question arising because it was a C++ conference. And uh, the, certainly a, uh, the compiler that we have for this runs C, but it doesn't handle templates, it doesn't handle C++, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out that the C and C++ share all the um, expression syntax and semantics for integer arithmetic. So we're going to use the C++ compiler to absolutely prove that our C program cannot fail. Uh, it's a confined environment it's hard to work in. It's a single chip thing. Oftentimes you don't have uh, logging. Oftentimes you can't even print anything out because you, <laughs> all the pins got occupied on the app itself. Uh, if there's a mistake uh, that you detect, there's no recovery. Uh, usually the mistakes aren't detected and a failure can be critical and even fatal. Uh, the, that's not an unknown situation. Uh, we've heard about, um, what's a good one, um, unintended acceleration. In those cases, they've never been able to find the actual cause. And I'm going to suggest that if the cause was something along the lines we've been discussing, uh, there's no reason why they would ever expect to find it unless they use this technique. So here's, here's how a stepper motor uh, functions in simple terms. It's uh, got a rotor and, and the rotor is magnetized and there are coils around a circle and these coils get energized sequentially and they draw the motor around the circle. It's, uh, this is the really simple idea, the real idea. It's the same thing, just made more complex. So our uh, goal here is going to be to energize these things in the right sequence. So far, it sounds pretty simple, and that's not too bad. But nothing is simple. <coughs> uh, the, when you have a situation like this, uh, the trick is the width of the pulses. If you make the pulses really long, the motor is going to take forever, to run too slow. If you make the pulses short, uh, the, especially when the motor is stopped, you need, it won't have enough time to get up to speed. So as a practical matter, what you want to do is accelerate the motor smoothly from stop up into the speed that it runs. So this means that these pulses need to start out at a certain width and then uh, get smaller as we get up to speed. Um, and already this is kind of, it, it seems doable, but there's a little, it's a little unclear. Remember, we're sending thousands of pulses a second. It's a little unclear how we're going to do all this calculation in the time allotted. <coughs> so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to start uh, trawling the net for uh, some guy who's already figured it out. And uh, I came upon this article, uh, and it's written by a guy named David Austin. It's a beautifully written article. And uh, by the time you look around, almost all the articles which deal with this subject end up coming back to this. So, uh, and this is written in 2004, and was printed in Embedded, Embedded Systems Journal or something like that. And so I looked at this article, and of course, you know, you, you look through the math and yada, yada, yada. And uh, hmm, hmm. And already, man, it, I'm already thinking, how the heck is this going to work? Huh? Uh, until I get, and he does the whole analysis, and he figures out how to calculate the width of every pulse. And then he said, you know, that's going to take too long. So we're going to make a, an approximation to that that can work just in integer arithmetic and check to see if that approximation is good enough. And uh, he does all of that, and he ends up with uh, our, original, um, <coughs> our original pulses distributed according to plan. And uh, let's see, 
and let's have a look here. Now about halfway through the, here, through the paper, he gets, well, that's equation four or nine. Ah, okay. He comes up with a magic that if we take the width of one pulse by using a simple formula, we can take the width of the next pulse. And then from then on, we can do that iteratively and we can generate all the pulses. And the formula is super simple. It works well within our integer arithmetic scheme. So now we have something uh, that's going to take well, what, five or 10 instructions. And that's fast enough so that we can do it in the, in the width of a pulse. So that means now we can run our motorized knife on this um, small microprocessor. And uh, so uh, this, this is the actual <coughs> uh, one that he's got. And it turns out that you refactor this slightly. It's, this, it's exactly the same formula. And then if you uh, do it on the down ramp, it's slightly different because the pulses start out very, very narrow and they get wider as you get, as they slow down to a stop. But the interesting thing, and this guy, so this guy's done, frankly, it's a beautiful piece of work. He's taken a, uh, the physics and then he's taken the engine, and then he's made an engineering job out of it, which can really make something practical. And all we got to do now is just write the code. So, Uh, oh, and, and, and so what, I, what is the code going to look like? Uh, it's going to have some sort of setup because the PIC microprocessor has a 449 page data sheet and it's filled with options and things to set and whatever. It takes you days to figure it out. Uh, but once it's done, you kind of have, don't have to think about it very much. And uh, so we're going to have a routine. We're going to have a call where you specify the target destination in number of steps, number of clicks along the stepper motor, and then you're going to specify um, an, initial, an initial width because the algorithm uh, starts out with some initial width and then gets smaller. And then you're going to just turn on the interrupts and sit back. And when an interrupt occurs, if it's at the target position, it stops. The, it, it doesn't do any more interrupts. Uh, if it's ramping up, it uses equation 13 to make a smaller delay for the next one. And if it's ramping down, it uses equation 14 to make a little larger delay for the next one. Then it sits back again and waits for the next interrupt. And so in principle, it's very simple. And also it's pretty accurate because uh, we're not really counting the instructions or whatever. We're just setting it up and setting the, up, the interrupt in terms of clocks and whatever little diddling around we did in there, it, it doesn't really matter because uh, it's going to come back at the right time. So now this is look, starting to look super promising. <coughs> and, well, and this guy, uh, David Austin, he was so, nice, so kind to include us the whole damn program. So it's like idiot proof. Uh, and, uh, you know, he does the initial things in here, and here's his step motor routine, and here is the, where you specify the new target position, and, uh, and here's where you initialize some registers, and you're in business. Uh, I'm going to take a little slight one-minute detour here, in that you look at this, and, I mean, we've established the guy's a really smart guy. I mean, there's no question there. And then we look at this, and you know, it's totally impenetrable to me. I look at it and I try and follow it, and it takes me like all morning to actually convince myself that this implements the algorithm which he has described. Now, this is not really a good situation because I'm making this surgical knife. I want to be able to look at the code and know that it maps exactly to the formula that's already been derived. I can't do that here. So that's kind of a side issue. We're going to address that a little later. But it's also very intriguing that such a, a smart guy and knowledgeable about physics and engineering, the minute he starts to type code, he just turns into a hacker like the rest of us. And it's very disheartening. So, Anyway, uh, we'll just keep that in mind and see if we can avoid that fate. Um, I, the original code was written in a, uh, a C-like language, 
So I had to uh, tweak it to fit into the microchip 8-bit uh, compiler, which is an ANSI C compiler. So now I have code which purportedly uh, I can compile for my, for my microprocessor, also could compile on my desktop. Now that's kind of moving in the direction where I want, where we're going to have a real algorithm and it's not really necessarily connected to the particular machine. And uh, <coughs> I verify that by, I run the compiler and this is what the, the, uh, the Microsoft XC8 compiler gives me back. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. Huh? It, it's uh, the whole code as we described there, the 179 lines of code, works out to 1300 bytes and we've got 32K. So we're, you know, we're like in, we're, we're relaxed now. Uh, the, the amount of data space we use is only 78 bytes. And we have uh, 16K available. So, you know, hell, we could go to a smaller processor. But anyway, uh, we're not going to do that because we're not going to change anything because they already want it yesterday and we hate working like under pressure on something like this. So anyway, uh, so what we do is we take this code and we factor it into a couple pieces. Uh, the main piece, this piece I've called motor.c, that C code, uh, that doesn't have uh, the types in it. It doesn't have the test framework that, that, that tries different things, doesn't have logging or anything like that. And so we have two versions of our program. This one runs on the, this one up here, uh, runs on the processor, on the microprocessor, so we can download it and hit the start button and it'll work or it won't work. This is the, the, the burn and crash method. And then we have another version uh, that we can run on the desktop and when it runs through the, the, the desktop code, it calls the functions in our main routine, but then it does logging or it does test or whatever we want. So now we have, we're really in a much better place than when we started because this code, which is going to run our target product, is we can actually test on the desktop, whereas before it was just about impossible. Uh, so, um, and this is what this looks like. Uh, it's got a bunch of stuff, at the, it includes new, uh, the safe numerics. It includes a thing we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it includes a couple macros which are decide, which are uh, manifest constants which are related to the, the, the total length of the linear motor. Uh, and then we define with the type defs a bunch of type defs which uh, are the types that our motor.c, our, our target code uses. So on the desktop, when we run our test, it's going to be using the safe numerics library. On the, on the target, when we download it and push the button, it's going to be using its normal types that it uses there. So we're going to be running the same program in exactly the same code in two, not exactly the same code, it's a totally different processor, but the same source code in two different places. Um, so, uh, and then uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another spot here. We, uh, the PIC has a, some special syntax and features for dealing with some PIC stuff. It's not particularly interesting, but we can emulate it on the desktop. And the reason why that's interesting, though, is that we will have exact, we won't have a different a different version of our program that works on the desktop and that works on the target. We'll have exactly the same source code. And that's important because the minute some guy sticks his finger to change one thing, then we don't have the confidence that we're really testing what we're flying. So uh, I, I made this little bit to emulate the, uh, the PIC has some instructions for changing one bit at a time and whatever. But I, with the, sort of the magic of uh, C++, I was able to replicate that. And now we just include right here our motor program and that is what's going to run on the target and run in our desktop. 
and then here's the desktop code and it's got uh, here it's got a test routine and it it prints some stuff out and it does all the stuff that test code normally does and here it initializes the system and it moves its position to a thousand then it moves moves to patient position a hundred and then it moves to position 200 again and it, and then it keeps a log of all the places it moved to so i can actually verify that this thing is is actually producing this curve here because I, I have the width of the steps and I, I could graph it or whatever if I had time. Uh, interestingly enough, the first time I did this, uh, this thing choked uh, at position um, five, uh, at 500 millimeters out because uh, apparently uh, Mr. Austin didn't run his to that extent. So either he never had a problem or he had a problem, had a problem and never knew it. So. Anyway, that's, uh, uh, so we already got some bang for the buck right there. Uh, now, one thing I alluded to uh, was in, from the very beginning, and also here is this promotion policy. I, I said that we're running the same code, the same program on the desktop and on the target. That's not strictly true. And, but we're going to fix it now. It's not true because if I have uh, two 16-bit integers and on the target, the natural they're they're promoted to the natural inter, integer size of the compiler in the machine it's running on. Now that natural integer size is different on the microprocessor target than it is on my desktop. So there are uh, situations where. The, the code would run fine on my desktop, but overflow when moved to the target. This is a, totally what I'm trying to avoid. I want to be able to prove they're the same. So, uh, and here's the question. If I, if I have uh, 30,000 and I do this expression here, what is the value of the x going to be? Uh, on Anybody got to want to take a guess? Well, it's not going to be 60,000, I'll tell you that because 60,000 won't fit into a 16-bit number. Um, Bora, maybe not. Uh, the, um, the, if I put that on the desktop, on the other hand, the desktop has a 32-bit integer size. And, but it's this, will, this, so when this expression here gets subjected to the arithmetic promotion that C++ does, it'll automatically bump them up to 32-bit to integers, and it'll return the right, right result. So this is, this is illustration of the problem that we, we're not mapping the actual arithmetic from the target to the desktop. So uh, the desktop doesn't give us real confidence that our algorithm actually has been tested. So what we, for our safe numeric types, we, we can specify what's referred to as the promotion policy. Since we're overloading all the, um, the integer arithmetic, we can uh, specify these, uh, these promotions, and we handle them explicitly. And via this policy, we're saying, when I make these safe integers, which is, in this case, a safe int 16, and using this promotion policy, then do not promote it to the natural integer of the desktop. Promote it to a 16-bit integer. Now, when I do the, uh, the integer arithmetic, it will fail on the desktop. And that's my key. Uh, at that point in the, on the desktop, since we have the ability to trap interrupts and whatever, this code, that previous code, will fail on the desktop and show me where it failed so that when I download it to the target, I know it will, I know it will work. I, I knew it will fail there as well. If it passes on the desktop, I'll know that it passes on the target as well because the, the, the integer promotion policies are being maintained to be the same. Um, so now the interesting thing is, uh, let's suppose I have a mistake and it shows up in the disk pot. I download it to the pick and I run it anyway. Hmm, what's gonna happen? Anybody wanna take a guess? It's gonna do what it always does and what we've been doing for 40 years. It's gonna do the calculation, return the wrong result, and keep going because that's what C++ does. 
And once we take the code off the desktop and we put it into the target, we don't have the safe numeric library anymore. We only really used it to check the stuff on the desktop. But once we put this stuff in the, in the uh, target, we've taken off our seatbelts. And, uh, you know, we're skinny dipping again. So uh, that's the, that describes the necessity and the utility of this of uh, being able to specify the type promotion for safe integers. It means that our safe integers can be used to actually emulate the arithmetic that occurs on another machine. Um, okay, this is, this is a, ah, here's a way to fix this. Or here's a way, one, now if you have this problem, then what would you do? Hmm. Well, we know in the, in the target machine, we don't have the ability to throw an interrupt or catch something or even emit an error message. Uh, we want to fix it. Well, one way of fixing it would be to use a larger type for doing, to promote to a larger type. And the way we could do that is, in this case, we create a safe integer uh, of 32 bits wide from the value 2. Now when we multiply that by x, which is a 16-bit integer, the C++ compiler, the way it works is it takes the two operands and it makes sure they're the same type by taking the shorter one and expanding it to match the larger one. So at this point, when this multiplication is done, now the temporary result, which is in the CPU or is on the registers, is a 32-bit number. There's no overflow here. And then we divide that by 4, which is a long division. Oh, no, actually, that's a super simple division. It's just shifting. And then we'll come up with a result, which is now fits in a 16-bit number again. So if we assign that back to x, we know it's still going to work. So, and we know it has zero overhead. The only extra overhead is doing this using this 32-bit number for the calculation, and which is the only, which is basically one instruction overhead that we need and cannot avoid if we're willing, because we've already said we're not going to tolerate any mistakes. And so the only way to guarantee that would be to do something like this. Now, those who are going to complain, well, the safe numerics library is going to increase your overhead and whatever, I say no. It will, in this case, find a place where you need the tweak to guarantee exactly the result you need with no extra overhead at all. Uh, there's other promotion policies. Uh, the, the, the default one is native. It just, and most of the use this all the time. The, the real, I'm, the, this usage case for the safety numerics library, I picked out because it's the very hardest one. And it illustrates the most difficult problems that we have to solve. Uh, but as a practical matter, I would expect uh, more people just to say, oh, you know, this program's not working. I'm just going to change the, uh, the integers to the safe numerics integers and see what happens. In that case, what you really want to, you don't really want to replicate anything else. You just want the normal desktop ar arithmetic to happen, but you want it to happen within the environment of the safe uh, numerics library so that all, any mistakes can be ca caught and checked. Huh? That's what you use the native, and that's the default one, and uh, that's what you'd use the native promotion policy for. Uh, you, use, you can use the automatic one. Uh, the CPP one is when you want to specify, like we've used here, uh, that uses CPP type promotion, but you get to specify the size of the types which things are promoted to. And then there's the automatic one, and what that does, that uh, automatically, uh, this thing that we ins inserted by hand by using a larger variable for the temporary result, it does that automatically. So if this were a type for which uh, automatic promotion was specified, then this, with zero runtime overhead, would never fail. Uh, unfortunately, your program wouldn't be C++ anymore because you've overridden the normal promotion rules in, a, in exchange for ones you think are better. Um, not everyone's going to agree on that. But in any case, 
The fact is, your program is not portable anymore because you've, uh, your program is not portable to regular integers anymore because you've actually altered the way that integers function. Uh, it's there because it's doable and some people might find it, I, I, it's really unclear what the future of that will be. It does work, uh, but I'm, I'm wondering about the repercussions if somebody were to actually use this in a big project. Um, so, so far, we made huge progress. Uh, we have our microprocessor. We can, we, we build a code on our, on our desktop. We download it in there. Uh, in order to verify that our actual code works, we can run it on our desktop. We can run it fully checked to know, to, to find every single arith arithmetic error. Uh, we can run, we can make 50 tests for it and run them all on the desktop. And we know that if they pass on the desktop, they'll pass on the target. I feel much better about going to the doctor's office now. Um, so, the normally on the desktop, uh, it uh, whenever we have an exceptional situation, uh, divide by zero or overflow or uh, any number of these situations which we detect. Up until now, we've detected them at runtime and had the program throw an exception. Uh, as is there a promotion policy, uh, there's also an exception policy where I can say what I wanted to do if it discovers, if it comes upon any situation which it can't handle. And uh, so normally it throws an exception. I could specify my own function, and there's a couple options there. But there's one in particular that is very interesting. It's, I call it a, a, a trap policy. And what that does is if you're program comes upon any part that will invokes this trap policy, uh, the program will not compile. Or if it comes upon any part where it has to check to do some runtime checking, it will fail to compile at that moment. So if you want to say, you know, my program, and, and this is the case that we have here, our target system can't do any runtime checking. It doesn't have the capability. It's being made in C. But on the other hand, I don't feel confident releasing that to the world knowing that I could still have an error. Oh, yeah. I could, I could, I could, I could, put, I could discover it on the desktop if I make the right test case. But who wants to be the test case on the target? No volunteers available. What we want is a provably correct arithmetic expression. And the way we do that is we compile our, we change our type from the normal exception policy, where it throws an exception, to the loose trap policy, or the trap policy, whereby if it even thinks about throwing an exception, it would, it basically it declares an, uh, an exception function which is not implemented, and so it fails to compile right at that moment. So if, and then of course, what do I do? I go back and jigger my program a little bit like I had before to know that there's, it can never fail at compile, it can never, it, it, everything's runtime overhead. Uh, excuse me, there's no runtime overhead. I change the types so that when the arithmetic is done, that there can never be any overflow. Normally this would be by using a little larger types in particular situations or whatever. It does turn into kind of a tedious operation. But the final result, if you can manage to do it, then you will have a program that you know with absolute certainty will never fail, and two, has zero runtime overhead, and can operate, and therefore can operate in an environment where there is no error processing. And uh, so, uh, and here's how you use it when you. Uh, in this particular case, I made a variable C. Uh, remember we talked about the pulse width in this guy's code. He specified uh, the variable C is the length, the width of that pulse. And the width of that pulse, uh, we figured out, uh, could vary between some minimum and some maximum. There's some, there's some pulse uh, larger than which we don't want to exceed, and there's some minimum size pulse we don't want to make it smaller than that. So, I've, there's a particular type of safe type 
where I can specify the range. If I were to try and store anything in, which was outside of the range, the program would fail right away. And if I try to do that at compile time, it won't compile. And uh, right now in this case, this has uh, the exception policy. So it would, it would compile, but if it were to occur, it would throw an exception. Uh, this actually turns out to be pretty handy because when you're talking engineering stuff or whatever, a lot of things have limits. You're not allowed to exceed or indicate some other error. And uh, it's very easy to actually specify more information about your variables. And it's bigger than that. Uh, let's see what the next slide is. I forgot already. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Now, it's a, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, if I have two variables and I know that they're only limited between with a range of 0 to 34, and I know that because they're safe ranges, and they can have any value from 0 to 34, well, you know, if I add two of those, I absolutely know that those, the result of that cannot exceed 68. I also happen to know that that fits into an 8-bit integer. So now if I have an expression, which is similar to the ones we had before where I was adding two 8-bit numbers, I had to account for the possibility that they might require 16 bits. Now I don't, because those calculations are done at compile time to know what the range of the final result is and compare it to the type of the final result. So this eliminates any, uh, so, so, so a lot of the things we think need to be checked actually can be checked at compile time. We do range arithmetic on the operand to know what the result operand is. And if that operand fits in the type, in the destination type, we're golden. We don't have to check it. And the library will not check it. If it exceeds what the, the destination type can hold, uh, it will insert the checking code to make sure that that never happens. And um, so that's, uh, that would mean if this thing uh, passes, well, that's, that's pretty much, I don't, wanna, I don't know what else to say about that. I know it's, it's a little bit obscure, but it's not that easy for me to figure out a better way to explain it. Um, Here's another case. I have a number like in an Eric, and we have we've had we've seen some arithmetic expressions which have the number two or four in them. Now, when the C compiler compiles those, uh, it it figures it's an integer uh, whose value could be anywhere from zero to thirty-two thousand. And when it does the compile time arithmetic, it takes that into account, even though I happen to know it's forty-two but the compiler kind of ignores that. So if I use this safe literal thing, what it does is it takes the number four and it makes a special type for the number four and then when it does the range-based arithmetic, it takes into account, ah, if I take the literal four and multiply it by 27, the maximum amount that that can reach is 109. And if that fits into a, a eight-bit number, I'm also golden. So we basically insert a lot of information about each integer so that it, when it does the compilation, it's checking ahead, it's thinking ahead into the runtime to know uh, when it needs to include the checking code and when it doesn't. This is, all this has been <laughs> fruit of the response to the question is, I don't want to have it check all this stuff because frankly, it takes a lot of time and it's not necessary. Uh, and I, if I say it's necessary, we'll say, but it still takes a lot of time. And I'm arguing that it doesn't really anymore. Um, <coughs> so now when we, at one, in for a dime and in for a dollar, I say, well, hey, this is a great idea. I have a special type just for the step width. Uh, and that has a range on it. So that's actually checked at compile time every time I use it. And then when I make an expression, it takes that type and it takes into account the, the, the maximum, the range of it, and it figures out the value of the result. So I'm keeping track of a lot of stuff here. And well, let's go for broke. So in this case, um, I what have I done here? Let's have a look. Uh, I created, 
Well, let's, let's finish this. Well, I think I, either I skipped a slide or I was worried about putting too much in. But anyway, what you can see here is these are our state variables which control where we are in the algorithm. It's the number of step we're on, the width of the steps, the position of the stepper motor, uh, the uh, which phase winding we're in. And so we, I created types for each one of those things. For example, the phase index around the, the rotor, in this case, it's only four. So I said that's a variable from zero to three. And um, the uh, pulse width is a maximum, I forget what it is, and the number of steps is a maximum of 50,000. So now when I do all the, um, the uh, expressions in here to, uh, with these variables, they're automatically getting checked and, uh, and I know that they're, that, well, they're getting checked on the desktop. And uh, the other thing that, yeah, and that's, so that's, what, that's what's happening here. I'm kind of overload, I'm inserting into my program a lot more information about the variables that I mean. I'm inserting for each variable the range, which is the legal range for that. It's costing a little bit of compile time, but no more extra runtime. Uh, another thing we've done is I've taken the, the liberty of taking Mr. Austin's program and I've, I've just rewritten the, the, the main guts of it here. So that this expression here is exactly the same expression, equation number 12, exactly transcripted. So I know it's right because I haven't had to, in my brain, shuffle stuff around and convince myself that what I ended up with is the same as what he started with. So I've, I've made my program replicate the algorithm as he defined it. Now, the boss comes along or something blows up or there's a self-driving car crash or whatever and the lawyers come to me, I say, here's, here's the algorithm we used and here's the code we used to implement it. Oh, and by the way, we've used the Safe Numeric Library, so I know that this code implements that algorithm. We have a chain of responsibility that we can defend. Now, as a practical matter, that's never gonna happen because when there's a disaster, everybody makes sure that they're not anywhere in the area. And uh, the whole, and all of these really bad cases, nobody has personally, nobody's ever gotten fired, nobody's ever been named, nobody's ever actually been blamed. So this is actually just a hypothetical concern. But anyway, it is nice to know that you can prove that your stuff works. It's, it, and you know, and this is not by testing. This is by, this is by um, observation. And those things that we can't observe, for example, knowing that there's no overflows or whatever, we're proving in a different way with the C++ template meta program. So, um, here's, here's what I just described. Here's, here's our original equations, and you can see how I transcribe them. You can double check them yourself. That it's, it's, um, it's, if we know that the arithmetic is correct, we can verify that, that this mirrors the formula. That's all I'm saying here. On this previous setup, there was no way to do that. And uh, the interesting thing is this doesn't take extra time. If we look at the amount of operations in here, multiplying by two, that's one machine instruction. It's a shift. Here, we, divide, we, we take a four and we, we multiply it by the, the current step uh, that's, that's a shift to two bits. That's one, my, one instruction as well. We increment it by one, that's one instruction. The only, and then on the numerator, we have taken the current step size and multiplying it by two, that's another shift to the left. So right now we're up into like four machine instructions. And this is on a 16-bit processor. So, hey, we're golden here. The only guy that is really a possibility that create a problem is that. That's a long integer division. On this machine, there is no such thing as implementing a subroutine. So if you're worried about time in this whole operation, that's the only thing you have to worry about. Everything else is just a waste of time.
to think about. Uh, and we've narrowed it in his original algorithm, specified the same thing. One long division at each interrupt. That's exactly what we've got. We're no worse off except for the fact that we have something that we can understand and probably even explain to the, to the manager. Maybe. Okay, so uh, here's, the, here's the strategy to minimize the, the, the cost, on, the, 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 the checking that occurs. Uh, we take our code, we run it, we, we, we do what we've done, and now we got to the point where it's running and somebody says, you know, how much are we spending on, uh, uh, how do we really know it never fails, or what, how do we do with a, uh, measure the amount of time wasted in run time. So it, all, the, all of the things, what we do is every place we, we're using the default exception policy, which is to throw an exception, we say no. We're going to replace that with the trap. And that means any time it has to do any checking, it might call an exception. At that point, it fails at compile time because we've said that that exception function is not going to be visible. So you'll get a syntax error at every point in the program where it might possibly throw an exception. In this particular program, it comes up in seven statements. So I know that those seven statements, it's possible that there could be, uh, 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 that the, if I'm running on the desktop, it'll do the checking. If I download it to the target, it's possible that there might be an undetected error. So our, our original goal to eliminate all the possibility of, uh, of error turns out that it hasn't been realized. We've just reduced it to seven instances in this particular example. It, perhaps with my more work, it might, um, it might be possible. But uh, the fact is, when you have a situation, and this is an interesting algorithm, we have C, the next C is equal to the last C times some arithmetic stuff. So when I, I depend on my range of arithmetic to predict the range in the next value, but since it just turns out that you, you can't increment something because the, the, the range of the result is always going to be the range of the operand, and so uh, it's hard to explain. So, but the fact is that there's still a little bit left for us to do as far as Ver verifying and guaranteeing that this cannot fail. Uh, but instead of the whole program with, well, it's now it's up to like 180 lines, uh, we got seven lines to check. And um, by the way, when you start doing this, you end up discovering all the stuff in your program was going on that you, that you took for granted. So um, that's the overall strategy. We, we, uh, we fix it so we run it on the desktop. We, we change all the types so that they make the minimum size. We run our tests. Uh, we think we got it. We, our tests pass. We impose, we change the exception policy to a trap instead of um, a throw. And we discover that, that here's some cases our tests did not catch. And we have to determine how we're going to deal with them. But here, at least we have. Uh, regardless of the size of the program, we've got a manageable task. Huh? It, and it may be uh, in the future that a number of these will also be addressed. Huh? Uh, but for now, um, I'm kind of done. Huh? Um, oh, yeah, and here's the final resu resulting program that we have. Uh, it, 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 has, uh, it, it uses our custom types, which are really aliases for safe integers with specific ranges. It surrounds all the literal values with uh, basically the word literal so that the compiler knows at compile time their range. Uh, in the future, I believe that this won't be necessary because I think C++17 has uh, an, a, a new wrinkle on the const expert stuff that it may make it this whole concept of specifying literal. Uh, unnecessary. Uh, we refactor the code so it's easier to understand and verify. Uh, and we've seen how we've done that. Uh, and so here we come up with the way our code looks. Uh, this is something we can walk through and understand and also know that 
if it looks like arithmetic here, it's going to look like arithmetic when you actually do it. And uh, let's have a look. Oh, and that's our code. That's the whole thing. Uh, the run, uh, this motor run is where you set the new position. And basically all that does is set some variables. And those variables also check to make sure you didn't, for example, set a position which is beyond the, the 500 millimeter width of the stepper motor because we, because the range of the stepper motor has the limits in it. So if you were to by any chance do what these guys did, hey man, this is great, you know, but we need the Mark 2.0. It's just the same. It just has a longer linear motor. How hard can that be? Ah, okay, no problem. We put in the new constant there and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But the thing is, we're not where we normally are. And the normally are is plug it in, let it fly. So. Um, let's have a little, let's see what I got. Ah, and that's the recap. Okay, so, wow, four minutes, that's perfect. Uh, anybody got a question? Well, it's either that or shout, take your pick. Okay. Uh, okay, the question is, um, would this apply also to floating? Would the whole question, would the whole issues we just raised uh, apply to floating numbers as well? Uh, I would say the answer is yes. The, the questions that arise are of a very, very different character. But the same problem occurs in that we have floating point... Um, numbers, sometimes they give subnormal results, sometimes we get a NAN. Uh, one thing here, for example, if I divide um, an integer by zero, it doesn't cra necessarily crash the mo uh, program, it throws an exception so I can handle it or reset. Um, the floating point needs that too, a lot of times. Uh, floating point is pretty complicated, and, um, but the same, we, the same, the more problems are worse than integers, but they exist on floating point as well. And if we want to make programs which, which uh, drive cars, uh, we have to up our game. And floating point would be part of that. But given the, the huge turnout we have today, uh, you can see it's going to be a while before there's demand for that. So I'm very discouraged. I'm very disheartened at the future of this. But that doesn't, uh, but I, did, I prepared the talk already. So here I am. Uh, I, I don't know if you covered this, and I just didn't quite catch it, but um, if I have a bounded range from, say, 0 to 15, and a bounded range from 20 to 30, and I add them together, what's the result of that operation? Do the math. Uh, you take the, the minimum from both sides and add them up, and it would be 20 to 30, and 0 would be the minimum, so that would be 20, and then uh, 20... What was the other range? Oh, the one was 30 and the other was 20. So that would be 50. So the resulting value would be from 20 to 50. And then that, since if the expression is more complex, then of course that would be plugged into the next stage. And it keeps track of this all through the whole process. So it, that's exactly how it works. And matter of fact, you can already figure out just from that explanation what this does. It, it intervenes and traps the, uh, it overloads the integer operations. It calculates the, does the range of arithmetic and then sees whether it's gonna fit in the result. And if it's a temporary result, it's fine. It just uh, keeps it for the next operation. So in principle, it's very simple. And you hit it right on the head. And the ranges, of course, can be plus, a negative and positive. Can, range can be anything. Uh, they, they're, because of problems in C++ arithmetic, for example, when I, when I add a, an unsigned value to a signed value, and then the, the, it's not just a question of promotion for size, it's converting the, the, uh, the, the signed value to an unsigned value, but then what if the value is negative? It, it's, it's just so murky. It's worse than floating. Floating point's pretty bad, too. But uh, the integer, it's, it's worse. But you're, you have it right on the head here, that the, it, it does exactly how you do it by hand, 
It just does it at compile time. And by the way, if, if you didn't have the safe numeric library and you want something like this, and you're really serious about not having an error of this nature, you have to do the same calculations by hand to know that that intermediate variable which you selected is, is actually not going to give you back the wrong result. So it does, if you think about it, uh, everybody should be doing it. Matter of fact, and if they're, they're not, because if they were doing it by hand, they'd be sitting here right now. Thanks. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's divide that into uh, a, uh, at least the first part is a real simple question. Uh, if you're reading input from the user, we all know you're supposed to check it. And, of course, we all know that a lot of times that doesn't happen uh, because it's coming from some other, uh, some, some BS excuse, you know. It's a big pain, you know. And then you have to deal with the error and whatever. So, but in fact, if you're using the uh, safe numeric, you can't avoid that. If you uh, read a safe numeric value from a stream, it's absolutely guaranteed that before it loads that integer, it fits. And actually, one of the very first slides show that is one of the examples. Now, I didn't understand your other question. Oh. So let's go to the next guy, and then we'll come back. Uh, okay, okay, that, 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 that question's got like about four things in it. So let's start off one by one. When you mix this with regular integers, as you would be if you were using another library. No, so the question is, what happens, first question is, what happens if you mix it with other integers? With normal ones, right? Uh, and what it does is, it does the conversion, that when it builds the expression, it, it does the conversion into safe integers so that everything is checked. So, and then if you want to take an integer out, a raw integer, uh, it will take the value and make sure that it verifies in the target it, that it works. So for example, if, if I do a complicated expression using safe integers and I pass it to some regular values, it will take the values, turn them into safe, safe integers, do the math, take the result, and then turn it back into the final result, which is not a safe integer, but make sure that it doesn't make a mistake when it, trunk, when it fits it in there. So that's the first question, was how do you combine this with regular integers? That's that answer. Okay. Now remind me what the second question was. Uh, whether you are able to uh, define a default value. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, are you willing to provide a default value. The, I, the, you have the ability to specify your own exception policy. And I don't know if that's sufficiently rich enough. I haven't investigated. Uh, in principle, you can, uh, it, what it does is it calls your function that you specify. That's what the policy does. Now, is, that, is the, the surface of that rich enough to uh, create a uh, bounding or a, uh, a truncating thing. I don't know. I'd have to look. Huh? Um, so that's one question. And what was your other question again? Mine was if you had distributed memory. I, and I think about like an HPC, we do a lot of with MPI. So you do reductions to say, you know, like how many units did you process? If both of those, how does it, how would, again, if they were close to overflowing, you're, 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 okay, the question is, if you had an MPI system, which is really complex and passing data around, how would you use this? Is that a fair rendition of it? And the question is, uh, you use it the way you, whatever, however you use an integer now is how would you, you would use it then. 
That's, that's the simple answer. It all comes down to original arithmetic, uh, integer arithmetic, and in that MPI system, you might have stuff that you're afraid might overflow, or uh, you know that we, an we anticipated 32,000 processors, and some guy comes along with 33,000, and now it's the same problem. It's got nothing. To, it's, 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 it's at a much lower level. When you define your integer arithmetic and your arithmetic types, you would specify the limits. And where those limits come from or what they're related to, not, Im not important anymore. Right? In other words, this doesn't fix your app. It fixes your integer arithmetic. OK. That sound looks like uh, we have no more questions, huh? Well, thank you for coming. Um, Remember, you guys heard it here first. Go forth upon the world, and you know now what no one else knows.